Introduction to Periodic Structures. I think this is going to be the start of a very interesting set of lectures in solid state electromagnetics. And this is the start. First, we'll talk about some periodic structures in electromagnetics to motivate the topic and describe really what we mean by periodic, periodic structure, because that can be confused. And then talk about how periodic structures are classified. Periodic structures and electromagnetics. There are many, many examples of periodic structures in use in electromagnetics. One is diffraction gratings. It's a bunch of very small lines with a period on the order of a wavelength. When light passes through this, it splits into a bunch of different directions and it's very wavelength sensitive. So different colors go in different directions and these are used very often to split colors. We can design periodic structures that act like mirrors. And so then if we draw lines down the middle of that, we can make them act like waveguides without having to use metals or other types of mirrors. If we do a similar concept, but completely surround some area with this material that acts like a mirror, we can trap light. Then there's metamaterials that interact with the wavelength at a very sub-wavelength scale, and these produce artificial permittivity and permeability. Antennas, instead of having a big giant antenna that's moved mechanically, we can have a whole bunch of little tiny antennas, and this is called an antenna array. And simply by timing the signal at each one of these, a beam can be steered electronically very, very fast instead of having to mechanically gimbal that which is very slow and takes a lot of energy to do. And of course, all the periodic structures I've been talking to, been talking about, can be incorporated into antennas to do all kinds of cool things. Slow wave devices. We could design periodic structures that interact with a wave in really crazy ways, and we can slow waves down so that you can actually walk faster than the light or the electromagnetic wave would be propagating through these things. Maybe some of the most famous periodic structures are what's called frequency selective surfaces. And it's one of the things that makes stealth aircraft stealthy. When waves hit this, we can do all kinds of cool things with that. Generally, frequency selective surfaces are used for filtering, but they can do other tasks too, such as invisibility. It's important we define what we mean by periodic structure here, because many people will be thinking about crystal lattices, um, salt crystals, quartz, and the atomic scale and the periodicity there. That is actually not what we're talking about here. We're talking about periodicity at a much larger scale, usually on the order of a wavelength. So for radio frequencies, we can pick up these structures like what I'm showing at the upper right, and you could stick your finger through these holes. So we're not talking about atomic scale periodicity. We're talking about periodicity on the order of the wavelength of the wave. Now, one thing that's pretty neat, we're going to borrow heavily from what folks have done with atomic scale periodicity called solid state physics. And we're going to borrow a lot of what they've done and apply it to electromagnetics. So that's why we're calling this solid state electromagnetics. Classifying periodic structures. There's really an infinite number of ways that a structure can be periodic. And so in order to start analyzing these and classifying them, we have to make some generalizations. The most specific are called the space groups. And somebody somewhere with way too much time on their hands counted that there's 230 possible ways that a three-dimensional structure can be periodic. Well, if we get a little bit more general, we can boil that down to the 32 crystal classes, even get more generic and more commonly discussed are the 14 Brave lattices. And we can get even more generic and talk about seven crystal systems. In this course, we're gonna talk mostly about the Brave lattices and seven crystal systems. How did people come up with and how do we classify and test lattices for different symmetry? And so there is what's called symmetry operations. So for the lattice at the upper left, 
we can talk about pure translation. If we can translate our position in a lattice, and after doing so, we see the same lattice, that gives us a hint or a clue about the type of symmetry that we're talking about. Another thing we can do is a rotation. If we can rotate the lattice and again see the same lattice, the same picture, that gives us another hint about the symmetry of that lattice. We can talk about reflections. We can reflect up, down, left, right, or other directions, and that also gives us clues about the symmetry of the lattice. Then, of course, there's combinations. So it's, it's operations like this. If we do operation A, then B, then C, and we see the same lattice again, that can tell us all of these different symmetries. And so that's how it's done. This is the same information as on the previous slide, but since a PDF can't run the animations, I have sort of a static version of that. So let's talk a little bit more about how we're getting more general and more specific about how we quantify lattices. So here's an example, uh, for example, of space groups. We have three different unit cells of three different types of lattices, and they're different. We notice this first one here, there's a square in the upper left, there's a triangle in the upper right, the second one, there's still a square in the upper left, but there's a circle in the upper right. Now over here, we have the square in the upper left and a triangle in the upper right, but now there's a star in the middle. So these really are different. And so we would call those space groups, and it's the most specific way that we can specify periodic structures. Now, instead of looking at diamonds, squares, stars, what if every site in the lattice was the same or a circle? And really, we're just talking about lattice points here. Well, if we do that, what we see is these first two really become the same. However, this last one here, which had a star in the middle, will replace with a circle. This is still distinctly different. But what we see by making that generalization is that we have fewer classes or fewer ways that structures can be periodic. And then even more, what if we just look at the outline of the unit cell? And that's our crystal systems. And now all three of what we started off with as being different is now classified the same way. So as we get more general and less specific about how things are periodic, the fewer ways we have that they can be periodic. Here are the 14 Brave lattices and seven crystal systems. So the big capital letters here, this is outlining the crystal system. So the cubic, the tetragonal, orthorhombic, monoclinic, triclinic, trigonal, and hexagonal. Now within these is how we enumerate the Brave lattices. So the cubic and to some degree the hexagonal tend to be what's of most interest. So within the cubic crystal system, we have simple cubic, body-centered cubic, and face center cubic. And we're going to talk a whole lot about more about those three in the coming lectures. In two dimensions, if we apply the concepts of Brave lattices, it turns out we have five, hexagonal, square, rectangular, rhombic, and oblique. Then there's the hybrid symmetries. And so a really common one is diamond. But the diamond symmetry is still face center cubic symmetry. It's just a special case of face center cubic symmetry. It's sort of like two face center cubics where one's offset by a little bit. There's zinc blends and there's other hybrid symmetries. But the reality is these hybrid symmetries aren't different. They're just special cases of our Brave lattices. Here's a quick aside, but in planar electromagnetics, hexagonal lattices are almost always preferred. And so really, what is the common theme here? And if we look at a square array on the left and a hexagonal array on the right, these both have the same lattice spacing A, but what we can see about the one on the right, there's less white. The packing density is much higher in a hexagonal lattice. So if I were a farmer wanting to plant the most number of trees on my property that I could possibly get, I would want to plant those trees in a hexagonal array. Now, I don't know how easy that would be to get a tractor around, and maybe there's other considerations, 
But in terms of getting the most number of trees on the property, a hexagonal array would be the best. I would get about 15% more trees on my property than I would using a square array.